So we are thankful to, to God for CABC. Um, we've really felt supported. We have our family, and Nita has her family. I have my blood family, but CABC has really been our one of our strongest families for sure. We've felt loved and cared for, and you've been with us on this journey, actually. And um, this is a picture of our family. Actually, God has blessed us with 33 years. Not bad. <laughs> and he's been pretty good most of the time. So, yeah. Uh, our kids, they came out to visit us. They're not kids. They're young adults. So they came to visit us in the Philippines in January. And uh, that was maybe the best visit we've had in many years. Mike said it was awesome. Uh, we... We had a, a great time visiting another island with them, and while, they, while we were all out, we had uh, Archie, he's a, he works with us, just to check on the house. And so he went around the house, checking in the rooms, and he opened up Michael's room, and everything was just, blah! And then he went to the next room, which was Cherry's, and it was the same thing, ah! And he thought there'd been a robber. He thought there'd been a thief, and so, but he looked around a little further, and it seemed, everything else seemed normal. He was talking to Anita, he said, oh, mom, I thought there was a robbery, and uh, I, I mentioned that for two reasons. One is that maybe some of you can relate to that, but the second reason is actually it, it kind of relates to what we're going to be talking about this morning uh, with zigzag. Zigzag isn't something that we hear about a lot in, in the Word. But I think it's one of those events in David's life that when they would come together for reunions, whether it was family reunions or with his military, he would say, do you remember Ziglag? Do you remember Ziglag? Because it was something that was deeply impressed upon his heart. And uh, I think there's a, for me, there's a message here. And I hope there's some encouragement as well for you. Ziklag was under the control of the Philistine king, Akish, and provided David plus his fellow warriors, Ziklag, as a safe residence or haven out of the harm's way of King Saul, who was always after David. He was trying to kill David. And so there was some kind of deal struck where David would provide, or David would provide him and his soldiers would provide security to the king Akish, and uh, in return they had this, this rest place, Ziglag. And they were only there for maybe about 14 or 16 months because it was after that that actually the Philistines went in and overthrew and killed Saul. Um, but during the time, uh, actually David was intending to travel with king Akish and fight against Israel, but Many of his officers, the king's officers, um, the Philistine uh, king said, uh, said to the king, we don't, we don't want David to come because he's, he could possibly turn on us and that could turn the tide in our battle against Israel and against King Saul. And so they insisted to the king, tell David not to come with us, tell him to go back to Ziklag. And so the king called in David and said, this is what... Uh, my officers are saying, I don't believe it. You've been completely loyal to me. I don't see any reason for this. I don't believe you would cause me any harm or us any harm, but I need to send you back. So please leave first thing in the morning. So David communicated this with his, his 600 men, and the first thing in the next morning, as the light came up, they were gone. It took three days to return to Ziglag. And uh, they were completely unprepared for what they would face there. Ziklag was a safe haven. But when we read in Samuel, 1 Samuel 30, we see that when David and his men arrived back in Ziklag, they were caught off guard. David and his men entered the village, and what a reality check. What a, the reality struck. The village was destroyed. The daughters, the sons, the wives, they were all gone. And the men and David all began to burst out in loud sobs. They wept and wept. And when I thought about this, 
You know, David, I don't believe he was given necessarily, or his men were given easily to tears. I believe they were hard men. They had killed people. They were tough. But when these men saw that their wives, saw that their, their sons and daughters were gone, they, they, they wept, they sobbed. And 600 men sobbing, can you imagine how far that sound would carry? And maybe miles. David, too, has two wives, Ahinoam. Can you imagine having a wife named that? That's hard to pronounce. <laughs> Abigail is easy. Her name means joy. David had lost his two wives. His joy was gone. It had been stolen by the Amalekites. And so we see that David, David after a time, well, we see that he's all of a sudden in a worse situation because these loyal friends, these fellow warriors, these guys that had, had been willing to die for David when his family were killed, or when, his, when their families had been taken away, all of a sudden they began to look at doing away with David. And so David, it says, but, but David strength, strengthened himself in the Lord. David ordered the priests to bring the ephod so they consulted and could or so that they could consult the Lord. Then David prayed, asking God, shall we go after the raiders? The Lord's response was, yes, you'll catch them. Yes, you'll make the rescue. Victory is yours. So David and his 600 men went. Along the way, 200 of the men stopped. If you remember, they had already traveled for three nights, three days, to come to Ziklag. They probably hadn't eaten properly, they were probably so tired, but they were, and so there were 200 that stopped, but the others went on and did rescue. If you want, you can read the rest of uh, that chapter 30. Uh, it's an amazing chapter. For me, it was something that really, uh, the Spirit of God really touched my, my heart with it. Let me go back here. Okay, so... Uh, I don't have up on the screen observations, but I did make some observations with regards to this situation. First observation was that David and his men were completely caught off guard. These were the, for the size of the group, 600 of them, these were the greatest warriors. Remember earlier on in Samuel that David and Saul were, were com um, compared that Saul could kill a 1,000, but David 10,000. And so even though they were small in numbers, they had many victories. They had many victories. One of the things that came to mind was that our great battles often come on the heels of blessing and victory. We can be involved in ministries. We can be involved in things that are bearing fruit, and something can strike, something like this. David had won many battles, and now he faced the most crushing blow. The second thing was, the second observation was that the enemies, the bandits or the Amalekites, uh, attacked the most painful and devastating, uh, made the most painful and devastating attack, and that was against the family. It took a heavy toll on these men, emotionally, mentally, physically, and so in our own situation, if there's an attack on us, whether it be our family, our children, or our, our, our spouse and our marriage, that's an attack that takes a real blow on us. They talked about how they wept, and they wept, and they wept, and they wept until they could cry no more tears. Uh, we have a friend. I, I haven't... I haven't really experienced or seen where there was such sobbing, where such pouring out. But we do have a friend uh, that was in Uganda, in Uganda with us, Filipino family, uh, husband, wife, and four children. And the third daughter, uh, Jenna, uh, became quite sick. And they took her to the doctor thinking, oh, it might be malaria took her to the doctor, they did a blood test, didn't find anything. No, it's a virus. Took her again, and they still couldn't find anything. Took her a third time, 
no, it's just, it's just a virus. And then a few days later, she became really, really weak. And um, she began to convulse. And they got her into the car. And they drove as fast as they could to the hospital. But before they got there, she passed away in the car. And it was painful. Just to see John in, in Elma just pounding the walls and sobbing. After Jenna's death, even, even for these men, they began to think, what did we do wrong? They began to blame themselves. They felt guilty. We shouldn't have left them alone. They began to blame themselves. And, um, you know, what did, what did we do wrong? What, why would this happen? Um, one, one more thought on John was that we, used, we began to meet after the death, after they brought Jana back to the Philippines to bury her. John and I would meet, and he said, you know, every, every day, every often, without thinking, I'm just expecting Jenna is going to come walking down the hall. And she never did. She never did. So as they began to blame themselves, feel guilty, it would have been hard to do anything. And actually, their blame of selves went further. They began to blame David. Here was a friend. He was closer to them than brothers. David had never had anybody so close as these 600. They had been loyal friends, but now he had become the enemy. <clears throat> the third observation is that his fam these families of the 600, the wives, the children, they were a soft target. There was no kind of security uh, measures in place. Josh McDowell was a speaker at one of the banquets at uh, the Mailbox Club in Georgia about three or four years ago. Actually, it was even more than that, about five years ago. And he was sharing that a study was done. It was conducted in Atlanta, Georgia. It took three years to do this study. It was by the U.S. Center for Disease Control. So this is completely government. And they concluded that the greatest protection of a child or children against uh, basically the wiles or the deceit of internet and pornography, the only protection they can have at all are deep biblical or religious moral convictions, deep religious convictions. And what Josh McDowell said that night, he's been working with children and youth for 50 years, so he's not an amateur with this, but he said, he said, we must disciple our children younger. Between four and six, we need to begin. You know, we all have our smartphones. I used to have a dumb phone, but there was so much peer pressure to get a smartphone. And you know, you can find so many things in smartphones. But children, four to six, can find pornographic. And they say that in the internet, almost, I think, 30% of the websites are porn pornographic. So we need to disciple our kids earlier. Uh, grandparents, what an opportunity. I know the parents are there as well. They're often busy, but grandparents, it would be a real opportunity as well. I was, Annie and I were traveling to Australia last August. We were doing a training with the evangelism explosion, and we met a young man from Bukhali. He was on the plane going to visit his mom. And I was telling him what we do at the mailbox club about discipling children or training teachers and that kind of thing. And he said, but um, isn't that kind of indoctrination? You know, kind of ingraining this. It almost sounded really negative. And I said, well, we're not forcing anything. It's a, it's a choice. And by the way, uh, Hollywood and Bollywood, they're indoctrinating. And... Uh, um, Social media, I tell you, they're indoctrinating. And um, so we talked about that a little bit more. And, 
And so the, the church and the family, we have a real huge responsibility. It's not indoctrination. It's providing some, some skills and some foundation so that the, uh, they're not attacked by some of the things that we've just mentioned here. In Ethiopia, we met with, we, we were part of, a, one of our partners was a church, 8 million members. Can you imagine? 8 million members. So the number of children in that church, 50% of the population are under 15. So they were with us and other groups that are doing children's ministry. They said, yes, please, you need to, you need to help us. You need to partner with us. And he said, you know, uh, the one of the largest religions is uh, actually the second largest Muslim, Islam is quite large in Ethiopia their head their head of their uh, religion they've said we want Ethiopia we want Ethiopia and we won't have it this generation we may not have it next generation but by the third it will be ours and then they'll have the whole horn of, of East Africa he said, and so he said, one of the things that they do, they bring the children to the mosque on Saturdays. They bring them in. They call it madras or madrasas, something like that. And they train the children. And they're serious with the children. He said, they, he mentioned that how if the children didn't memorize, we'll beat them. They'll beat them. Now, I don't know whether we should begin beating the children downstairs. We probably would be all go to jail. <laughs> but, you know, we need to be serious about it. We need to really take the opportunity because we only have a small window of opportunity. The second thing, so there's the idea of getting to the children, discipling them younger. The second thing is that they did a study of students, students that had attended churches all their life. They went to university, uh, secular universities, and we know that often the kids, the, the, the students come back and they've the professors have been able to convince them to give up their faith. And they said one of the things that they found when they did the survey is that those students that had an important adult, not just parents, but like an uncle or other men or women in their lives that were checking on them, they found that these ones had a, a greater retention of keeping the faith. And so what a, what a challenge for the church that you know, we have our own families, we follow up our own kids, but we, we need to be big brothers, big sisters. Um, I'm not talking about the reality show, by the way. I'm talking about, like, big brothers, um, the organization. And I know this from personal experience, that when I was going through difficult times uh, in my late teens, uh, I was, uh, I'd made some wrong choices you might say. I was under the influence of alcohol, and uh, my friend and I were out one evening, and we, we got in trouble with the law. And so we, I, we had both ended up going to court, and, but I thank God for the response of the church. There were some, some of the elders, when they would see me come into the church, they would put their, like this. But, there were others that really, really loved me, really cared for me. They would write a letter to me. There was one particular letter that I received. Wow, we can really see God working in your life. I said, what? <laughs> At that point, I wasn't needing a lot of condemnation. And uh, I already knew that I was, I was messed up. So we thank God for his grace and those uncles, as it were. The fourth thing, fourth observation, so we've talked about being caught off guard, uh, the family being the most painful and uh, being the family, when the family's attacked, this creates the most painful and devastating attack. And the third part was the soft target. The fourth observation is that David's strength was in his God. He sought God's wisdom. I'm wondering what that would look like because it doesn't give much description. It just says that David uh, strengthened himself. His strengthening came from the Lord. So what's that look like? 
Would that be some kind of a spiritual rest? Would it include uh, maybe diet, having a good meal? I think what it was is that David, when he realized that he was up against the wall, and he, his, his hours were probably a few or less, he just said, help, help. God never refuses the word help. And when he did that, he began to just reflect on um, God, he began to real, uh, reflect on what he had done in his life and who he was, he, who, he, who God was. I think also there was probably a bit of a praise fest maybe that took place. You know, I've known some poets before. They can just sit down and they just start to write. And it's like it, it's coming out of the heart. It's not like they have to think up here, but it's just, wow. And it's just some of the Psalms, I'm sure, must have come from Ziklag. They must have. David was strengthened in the Lord. He strengthened himself in the Lord. After that, we know that um, he asked the, the priest to bring the ephod, and they began to inquire of God. And God said, he said, what should we do? And God said, yes, go and rescue them. You can rescue them. And the question for us is, uh, for me, God, how do we rescue our kids or our families? How do we prepare them for battle. This morning I was uh, up early, 3.30, quarter to four, and um, I was thinking about today. I don't speak very often, so I think, oh man, am I going to embarrass people, <laughs> myself, uh, but thank God. Anyway, as I was thinking that, I remembered a song, a hymn, and it's on uh, page four. 432, it's only believe. And so I, I just learned the chorus just, just a few months ago, but I remembered that, and it goes, only believe, only believe, all things are possible, only believe. And I began to just meditate on that at 433, 34. Oh, the peace, the peace of God came upon me. We were in Uganda, you're familiar with that, and uh, during our time there, there was a, a civil war that was underway, and uh, it actually lasted from 1987 up to about 2005. In 2002, we were there already, and uh, um, the, the government of Uganda were irritated. They were frustrated with the, the rebel movement because they would raid different places, they would um, ambush vehicles, and they had, there was, it just created some insecurity there in northern Uganda. And so they went into southern Sudan where they had, where the rebels had their, their camp set up. And whatever happened, they arrived, they had every, all the, all their, their military there, but for some reason, they either found out somehow and the, the leader, he got out, and they just, it was like taking, if you can imagine having a big stick and hitting a beehive, it's full of bees, hitting it, bah, and then the bees go out, and they just swarm. And so the rebels began to go back into Uganda, and they would go from village to village, they would burn houses, they would kill people, they would slash, they would take even babies, young babies, from the mother's hand, smash it on the tree. Just brutal, brutal. And one of the commodities that they wouldn't hurt, but they would take, was children between the ages of 8 and 14. Because those ones could be trained to be good soldiers. They would, some of them would become wives of the soldiers, but they could fight. They learned how to thrive in the bush. They knew how to fight with limited um, arms. In fact, the government soldiers, they were 100,000, 100,000, 80,000 men. There was 20,000 rebels at the height. And yet, and they were better equipped, and yet the soldiers, the government soldiers were scared of the rebels. They wouldn't go near them. 
And these are children. These are ones that have been trained as children. When I think about that, um, you know, the church as a whole, nationally, internationally, what would happen if we exerted more, more focus and energy and prayer and finances on children, training them so that they're not only um, street wise and are no longer soft targets, but actually become a force to be dealt with. Can you imagine our children? I've seen children pray with adults. It's amazing. I've seen children praying with adults and the adult pulls over. The power of God is moving in children. So children equipping. Uh, six reasons why, uh, for some of you that are involved in children's ministry, this may be review. And, uh, but we know that Jesus commanded us to reach boys and girls. That's in Mark, it's in Luke, I believe, and Matthew. He said, don't hinder the kids. Don't let them come to me. Don't forbid them. The second reason is that children are the greatest harvest field in the world. They're the most responsive. 80% of those that come to Christ will come as a child, 14 and under. So then, as it's older, it's not saying that those that are older will not, but the number decreases significantly. We know that adults, there's a lot more things in the way blocking that, whether it be pride, whether it be brokenness. They simply, children come just at God's word. And there's children everywhere, lots of children. The third reason is children, yeah, they're the largest unreached people, our unreached group, two, million, two billion children in the world. And, uh, yeah. Fourth thing is that ch children, if they're one to Christ and properly discipled, can lead long, fruitful lives for the Lord. These are some of the names of individuals that came to Christ at a young age. Paul Rader there, he was um, a convert of D.L. Moody. He was a child when he came to one of the meetings of D.L. Moody in Chicago. And Paul Rader wanted to go into the meetings. But when the adults saw him going in, they said, no, 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 you stay outside. He wanted to go into the meeting. And so he, he, he resisted, but then he ended up sitting down and crying. And Dale Moody came. And he said, son, why are you crying? And he said, well, they won't let me in. They won't let me come in and listen at the meeting. And he said, okay, son, you hold on to my, my jacket. He had a, a long jacket on. He said, hold on to that and walk behind me. Don't let go. So he went right up to the front. He went up to the front and he put the child on the chair. And... <clears throat> That child listened, that child came to know the Lord, that child was discipled, and then he became an evangelist. You know, we can look at a child, a child, and not see God's significance, but God has something for each child to do. That, in fact, a hundred years later, that song that that child has written as an adult can still impact us today. So... This is a child who came to know the Lord in October. She'd come to know the Lord, and actually her life was so changed, even at five and six. She came to know the Lord um, on the 20th of October. On the 22nd, she died. This girl became a missionary for two days. But for many years, that church had been trying to reach that community, and they were hard. They, when the pastor would speak to them, they would say, ah, no, thank you, we don't need that. But when this girl died, because she was a part of them, because over the time that she'd been going through the lessons, they saw the change in her life during her wake. You know, the, the drinking, they're playing mahjong. But the pastor began to speak to them, 
and all of a sudden it became quiet and all the eyes were on the pastor. It's a little girl, through a little girl that this community began to, to listen. And also finally, adults can learn from a lot from children as well. I won't spend too much time on those right now, but there's a lot we can learn from them. This is the area that we're focusing on, Southeast Asia, and uh, based in the Philippines, but very much involved in the countries surrounding. And it's because of partnerships that we're able to, and we're asking the church, anybody that has uh, connections in any of the countries in Southeast Asia, let us know. We would love to connect with them, whether it be Cambodia or Vietnam or, or Thailand or wherever. Let us know in the Philippines as well, so that we can possibly partner. So with our partners, we also train. I think what we're going to do is maybe ask, uh, we're having a little bit of problem here. So there's only a few pictures of, oh, here they come. There's a video that we want to show. It's called the 414 window. Maybe we can play that now. There is a window a window you might like to know about. Not the kind that lets you look at the sky. It's a window that opens up inside a child's heart. A window of time. Because over 70% of all decisions for Christ happen during a very precise window, from ages four to 14. And those who accept Jesus during this window are more likely to keep the faith. But that's not surprising, is it? Even Jesus said, Unless you become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So here's a great question. If 70% of all decisions for Christ happen during the 4 to 14 window, why does the average church focus only 3% of its resources there? Remember when the children came to Jesus? His disciples said, don't bother the teacher. The disciples looked down, but Jesus knelt down and saw open windows open hearts, open minds in need of his love. And he said, let the little children come to me, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. In fact, God saw the full potential of children over and over in scripture. Like David, a simple shepherd boy chosen by God to kill a giant. Samuel, a little boy called in the night to be God's prophet. Miriam, who saved her brother Moses so he could save God's people and Jesus himself at age 12, revealing great wisdom to the adults in the room. Where the world sees immaturity or foolishness, God sees open windows, tender, trusting hearts, responsive to his leading. But today's children need our help. Around the world, a billion kids, half of all living children, suffer physical poverty. Meanwhile, children in developed nations live in spiritual poverty. Only 3% see life from a biblical perspective. But we can bring hope. Four out of five kids still hunger for God, and we can help them find Him and awaken the heart of belief that God sees in them. Today, we have an amazing opportunity to bring God's love to millions of open windows, children at home and around the world receptive to the truth. So let's give our very best, where it counts the very most. Let's see children with the same great stature that God does, because the best way to shine light into a dark world is through open windows. Visit 4to14window.com. Win the heart of a child across the street or around the world while the window is still open. appreciate the ministry of Paul today. We will ask them to be coming up here and I'm going to ask all members of the board to join me. We will recommission Paul and Eddie. They will be leaving for the Philippines and for Southeast Asia on Thursday morning. So please, we will remember them even right now. Please, Anikam and all officers, please join me here.